What's up, rock and rollers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram at talklouder underscore podcast. And of course, our website, talklouderpodcast.com. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And I'm really excited about our guest today. He is Jimmy Ashurst, who you may know mostly from his time in Buck Cherry. He was the bass player in Buck Cherry uh, during their big comeback years. He played on the 15 album. He did a number of records with them, uh, enjoyed a lot of success with them at the time. And previous to that, he played with Izzy Stradlin. Uh, when Izzy left Guns N' Roses and put out a couple solo records, Jimmy was on board for that. Um, he played in a band called The Broken Homes, which was kind of overlooked back in the day, but has come to be widely respected in the underground. Uh, a little more roots rock and roll maybe than the than the scene that was going on around it at the time, uh, but worth checking out. Featured and, uh, one Craig Ross, who plays with Lenny Kravitz on guitar. Correct. The guitar player was Craig Ross, who has been with Lenny Kravitz now for years. And uh, Jimmy's also uh, one of these guys that's kind of done a lot of side projects, and he's been involved in things, you know, that were very short-lived, but uh, but really cool. One of which was a band called Smack, uh, underground band from Finland, uh, I know a few of you out there will know that name because you're geeks and nerds like us. Uh, but Jimmy was in that band for a minute. Uh, we talked to him a little bit about that as well today. So um, he's joining us from his place in L.A. And uh, we look forward to talking to him. Always a great conversation. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us and being on the show. I've wanted you on the show for some time, and I appreciate you doing this on short notice. Um, at first, there was a little bit of a hang up, at least on my end, because I thought you were in Italy for the longest time. Uh, but then you texted me and said that you're back in the States. Uh, so so where are you right now? Are you in L.A.? Yeah, I'm in L.A., man. I was there for a while, though. You're right. I'm kind of back and forth. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I, we could have done it from there. It's just a big bigger time difference you know yeah but uh yeah i'm here man well LA, we, you know yeah you, you're you've had this place that overlooks that is that sunset strip in the background uh sunset's the other the other way actually behind it's that way for me but okay. um yeah i'm like uh without giving away my location to uh precisely <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't Whoops. want the you don't want the men in black knocking on your door, right? No, sir, I don't. No. <laughs> unless you get your, unless you get your blue or green, I don't want anybody knocking. Unless you get your door. mail under an assumed name, you're screwed anyway. So. PO box or something. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. let's let's uh, let's kind of walk through your career because uh, you've had uh, you've you've done some pretty amazing stuff, and uh, uh, the 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 band that I think was your first claim to fame was Broken Homes, and I know there was a lot of stuff in between some of the more major bands, and we'll touch on that as well. But uh, let's start with Broken Homes. Um, when when what's that time frame? How many albums you were signed to MCA? I know you did a couple of uh, tours with uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan for one. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I think you went out with Joan Jett and the Georgia satellites, but sort of summarized, uh, your days in broken homes for us. Indeed. I mean, I, uh, been, I think all together in three, um, band bands, you know, any, uh, that anyone would, uh, remember, um, including myself, but, uh, and then, you know, then there'd be, you know, periods of, uh, inactivity, like long extended periods of of nothing in between but um yeah the broken homes was uh early early 80s man i think we got the record deal in 85 our first album was 85 or right around there 85 into 86 something like that and uh, but prior to that there was um you know uh some uh activity joining you know i hadn't been playing bass for very long it's a matter of months in fact when uh when that um came about and uh we got a record deal uh real quickly 
And so, but prior to that, I joined, you know, I was joining any band that would have me, you know, because I, you know, was trying to figure out how to play and how to, um, you know, how to be in a band. And so I was joining um, several, I think there was like a little mod band at the time um, that I was in. And that's how I uh, ended up in the Broken Homes. They had left, a, a, we played on the Santa Monica Pier and um which was a cool gig and um after the show there was a note on my amp saying you know if you want to you know we're a band we have a manager and uh if you want to join we have a gig at the roxy and i was like fuck me roxy awesome so um you know i called the number and uh and it turns out that that was uh craig ross who left me the note and so that's how um i met those guys and so the broken homes was like uh it was a rock and roll band and uh, one that uh, introduced me to a lot of stuff. Like Craig was playing um, open G tunings, which I had never, you know, knew I had never seen or heard before, which kind of threw me a little bit for a loop because at the time I had become accustomed to recognizing um, where I was on the fretboard based on the hand shape of the guitar player. And at that time I'd been playing a lot with Mark Ford in his, um, in his folks' garage. Right. So that's kind of, we'd be in there for fucking hours and hours and hours and learning dynamics and stuff and for how to, you know, work within a band and stuff. But I only knew from whatever hand shapes I could only recognize his. Right. And then with open G is sort of, sort of one finger. So I was like totally at a loss at first, but you know, uh, figured it out. <laughs> we got through it. I think that but, that's, uh, the first that's pretty, album came out. Yeah, the first that's album pretty came punk out. rock and and awesome and <laughs> and loosey goosey and uh, throw another awesome in there at the same time. Just like obviously you had you had what it took. It was just to you know don't put a chart in front of me because I'm going off of the the leaves on the trees. Sure, and yeah. um, that was sort of the spirit. Uh, yeah. Hell yeah. And we didn't, there was no place really to learn it other than by doing it. So you yes. just, you know, and so that comes, um, you absorb that pretty quickly. Yes. And you know, you, you pass through as few moments of sheer terror, but, um, you know, you, well, you, do, you do manage to figure it out. Those and never, prior, those never end. Actually. They don't, yeah, yeah. they actually don't. <laughs> um, prior to that, I'd been, uh, I mean, I, I think, Dave, you're familiar with, um, I'm an army brat, so my dad was U.S. Army, so I grew up in Europe and uh, was born there, um, but I was comfortable over there, and um, so I had done a long pilgrimage to London from, from Italy in uh, 81, I think, and that's when, I mean, it took me, you know, a month to hitchhike through to get from you know where I was to London but um when I arrived in London it's a it's quite a long story but I wound up uh, I was you know I was a punk rock fan and so I loved the clash and I loved the damned and uh stiff little fingers and those were one of my sort of favorite bands and what um what excited me and so I was just more curious about London and uh, once I landed there I wound up being sort of saved by uh the drummer and the damned um who took me and i was 17 and um so i wound up in the recording studio with those guys um you know sort of trying to make myself useful you know rolling joints or whatever it was making tea and it was pete townsend's freaking studio man it was um on uh eel pie island in the thames and um it was just beautiful, man. You know, and I was just watching them work. I think they were mixing uh, strawberries. And then I was there also for, you know, back then um, it was a singles sort of a culture. You know, they would release an album and then they would just release a ton of singles, each with new artwork and stuff. So I was in London for some recording of some of those B-sides and things. So that, I mean, that was my introduction to it and um as i was staying with rat at his place he uh you know he basically was like you know what are you going to do with your life kind of thing and i didn't have a clue <laughs> so um you know he's like you should be a musician <laughs> so that's kind of 
how that came about. I just picked the bass because it only had four strings, right? Yeah. <laughs> how hard could it be? <laughs> so from there, you make it to, uh, you know, eventually you make it to L.A. You you, you end up in the broken homes. Um, t- uh, being from Texas, I'm curious to know, what was the tour with Stevie Ray Vaughan like? It was awesome. I mean, we now that I look back on it, we had just begun the tour, really. Um, and, um, of course, we were pretty you know, scared to death because um, we didn't know, you know, that we had been told that um, you do a, a couple of gigs and, um, you know, if, if Stevie Ray likes you, then you can do the rest of the tour. And we were like, shit, what, you know, what do you mean if he likes us? <laughs> so, like, so we were petrified at the first sound check and um, sort of trying to make sure that we had it shit together for the show. Um in order, you know, for him to approve the rest of it. And, and right after the sound check, we were sitting in the dressing room and he, he was, he walked right in and he was like, Hey, you know, don't worry about it. You already got it. So he was watching the sound check. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. It was wild. And then, um, that wound up, uh, unfortunately in Troy, New York. Um, and, uh, it had been, it was one of those like really, bad winters and stuff so i remember that and uh and that's where the tour basically ended because he had um he had some uh medical emergency and uh and bailed out they sort of wheeled him out you know of the hotel <laughs> so that was the end of, that was the end of that but um it was interesting i mean all of these tours man early on is, again it's a it's a learning experience and so that's where you start to get your sea legs, you know, by doing it and being accustomed to how touring works and how to be, you know, instead of a bunch of assholes, you, you, you know, you sort of absorb the professionality of um, whoever you're opening for and watching how they operate, how their crew operates. And uh, so, you you know, all of these cumulatively um, turn into the education, uh, you know, by us, you absorb it. Yeah. And um, so that was one. And interestingly, back then, uh, we didn't have, you know, anywhere near the technology we have now. So um, just sonically uh, watching how his tour operated, we were playing in um, in concrete sort of like hockey arenas and shit like that sports you know, venues, which are not built for, you know, sounding good. Right. And um, with Stevie Ray Bond's crew they'd been doing it for so long that um that they would actually find areas within the structure that we were playing to um to enhance the sound so basically what would what would have been our dressing room you know at a certain point you'd hear these guys coming down the hall like clapping everywhere and getting the reverb sound and then they'd come in our room and be like oh this one's good sorry boys you gotta go and they'd wheel in you know either a, an amp for the Le- the Leslie cabinet because he had a B three with the Leslie and so sometimes they'd mic that in our room or it would be one of his amps and so either we stayed in the room and you know we're like fuck what you know what <laughs> you know or we would find another you know shit the broom closet or whatever to hang out in. <laughs> that was cool i've never seen it since man i mean it was it yeah was that's a wild that's out. a that's a really cool i mean that's a studio trick find the room yes. that fits the tone and sound and ambient that you're looking for on on a record and live you're just taking your your mix serious I mean, exactly you know, right and they would mic it up and then they'd run the mics out to front of house and yeah. um so they were getting the sound of that room for yeah you're either the, you know. your, your shitty punk rock band wouldn't give a shit and they no. it would be and it would sound great it would be perfect for the what you got going on but that's uh, yeah, that's that's just professional studio shit going on there that's awesome that's oh, these really, are serious texas boys yeah they, they were what, running they, they were running some cable into your dressing room yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of snakes going down I the hallway it, yeah. yeah that's awesome so, so um, did the did the the Broken Homes kind of strike me as a band that was you know kind of un- unfortunately kind of hard to market because you didn't fit in with what was happening at the time and I think you kind of have gained maybe a wider audience uh, since sort of after the fact because now people uh, are aware of you or 
or or have a greater appreciation for that type of music. Um, but so so did the did the band come to an end because Craig was poached by Lenny Kravitz, or was the band already you know kind of sputtering out at that point? You know, it's interesting that you use the word difficult to market because in our minds. Um, it was a rock and roll band in a very American tradition of rock and roll as we understood it. And um, for me to be, it's been 35 years now of people saying it's hard to market in America. And it's very difficult for me to, to understand why that is. Um, you know, uh, we have, um, you know, some of our, great national heroes like Tom Petty. His first album apparently was difficult to market as well. Yeah. Uh, they marketed him as new wave, right? right. Remember with the skinny tide. Yeah. So uh, again, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's still happening and yeah. I don't understand it. I honestly don't because um, it's, uh, it's music that originated here in the United States and in my view, it's um, one of our most important cultural exports to the world. Yeah. And for it to be difficult to market to our own audiences, is, um, it's been a constant struggle. Every um, band I've been involved with has run into this in one way or another. And, great, um, great perspective. I feel like uh, even yeah. even uh, English bands being trying to catch a ride here in the states when you think about when the first elvis costello record came out and then you think about the first tom petty record there's in my opinion there's some similarities in just what's going on just when you when you squint you know we have uh, a fundamental disconnect here yes. and, I, and i'm and i'm um i've tried to you know figure it out philosophically for many many years that's what I do in between bands. <laughs> any, any luck, any <laughs> luck so far? Right. Yeah, yeah, and I haven't gotten it yet. But <laughs> if you look back, I mean, everyone from uh, you know our great jazz artists to um, our great blues artists have uh, emigrated and then come back. It's almost as if we need it to be done somewhere else and then sold back to us. Yeah. Uh, and time for us to for 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 it to sink in. I, I, I don't see why that it. Do, but, you feel, um, do you feel like they called it new wave back in the late 70s and early 80s and stuff because they did because of this problem? Because they, they have to call it something. They didn't have a little box to put it in yet. So they uh, unfortunately, I mean, we've had the name for quite some time. It's rock sure. and roll. Yeah. Right. That's right. I don't know that's why right. they just don't call it that. That's right. right. Yeah, because that's what it is. <laughs> but Amen. there is no yeah. there is no rock and roll genre on radio, right? Unless right. it's we're still slaves to radio. Uh, the the way the industry, you know, the way I mean, uh, sadly, um, technology. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of the stuff takes a while to catch up. So, I mean, the the vernacular used the rock and roll thing. There doesn't seem to be any distinct format so that's why the struggle from a marketing perspective is they don't know who's going to play it on the radio unless it's 20 years old if it's 20 years old then it comes up on classic rock stations right. but yeah. if it's 20 years old you're already dead <laughs> or you know your guys are gone or whatever man so it's not helping us out a whole lot it's pretty but terrible. if you look back in pretty history scary. Yeah. And uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix had to go to the UK. Uh, the Stray Cats had to go to the UK. Tom Petty went to the UK. Yeah. All these guys went to and did their, um, you know, European runs. And then they, of course, were appreciated there and uh, or globally anywhere else, really. And then they come back. And then all of a sudden, somebody, some executive is like, well, shit, this is getting a lot of attention. We got to address this somehow. And they'll, uh, you know, then maybe, you know, you'll get that, um, you'll get that little window. But we don't have uh, uh, radio stations for um, new rock and roll that's being created. And so we end up with um, hearing the same 10 songs, you know, every day on, yeah. on radio. And then, um, you know, and then that, that sinks into the consciousness of the people, which then, people currently 
you know, playing covers or playing their old hits or whatever it is, but it kills new music. Yeah. And um, we're in serious jeopardy of losing, um, you know, there's no incentive for a young rock and roll band. It's just such a struggle. It's you know, beating your head against a brick wall. I feel yeah. like there's there's a lot of um, management and even bands that have umbrella companies that own venues as well as radio stations. Um, and so they're kind of the tastemakers and there's deals being made on the golf course. I mean, I'm sort of like making that up, but no, I really not. underneath <laughs> it's true. And I also feel like, and that, that ties into what you were saying, it, like verbatim to exactly what you were saying about oh, it's it's, a uh, lot of the, the same. In, the industry, I mean, it's, you can, having toured and I mean, I've been very fortunate to have been had the opportunity to tour in three decades, you know, four, I guess now. And, uh, you know, certain things you start to start to absorb after a while is it's a consistent and it's getting worse. And as you said, I mean, we're, we're dealing with monopolies at this point. Yeah. Um, everyone's in it for the short game. There's no artist development. There's no, right. you know, if you're, if your album sucks, they used to let you do another one. Yeah, you know, I'll try it out. I feel like I feel like it's been like that for twenty years now. It has, and um, even worse, we've arrived at the point where um, the industry are the rock stars, and we are the commodity mm -hmm. in this country. Um, yeah. Again, it's not yeah. happening anywhere else as as bad. I mean, some of these are global corporations that are that are taking over, but. Um, but listen, for in order for a band to, um, especially a rock and roll band, to get any kind of uh, uh, a break, they have to have money to buy onto a tour. They have to have money to pay, you know, somebody at a radio station or whatever, uh, indirectly or directly. And uh, uh, in my view, I don't want to hear music made by rich people, man. It doesn't uh, none of the music I like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so we got right. a problem. You know, something that, that also ties into not to go not to step back into the crap we were talking about, because it, it is crap. Um, but uh you know uh James Brown bought the radio station so he could get so he could promote his own shows when he came through town in certain markets. Um I think that he was one of the first guys, you know, to get his his record played more on the radio and to, to sell more tickets because he paid the radio station and or ended up buying the radio station. And I just think that he was a businessman the whole time, but he was not into it for the short and quick buck. He was into it because that was his business and whatever it took to get his business off the ground. That's what he would do. And, uh, you know, it's the like owning your own masters, Ray Charles, Buddy Holly. It's, it's uh, been uncovered that, you know, it's it's common knowledge that those guys were the early birds to go into the record execs and go, what are you talking about? That's my music on there. It's Man, not your music. That. That's my music. I didn't know that about James Brown's radio station. That's great. Um, at a certain point, you have to, uh, you know, you can beat your head against that wall all you want, but you have to get a little gangster. And uh, yeah. at some point, and at this point, I mean, it shouldn't be that way. But it is, you know, yeah. um, sadly. And uh, and here we are. So now we do have uh, some opportunities for workarounds. You know, you can you can make your own record. You can press yeah. it. You can do all that instead of, you know, major labels will always have a distribution network and they'll always have ties. You know, they'll have a depart radio department and all that shit. But at this point, man. It's, uh, you know, but they're still also, you know, antiquated to still charge you for breakage, you know, distribution and breakage. Where, where, you know, that go, goes back to the 70s and 80s where, the, you know, you break a number of vinyl records and shipping. And they're still charging us for that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, dude, you're not sending anybody shit, you know. Right. <laughs> so how did how did Craig end up uh, with uh, Lenny Kravitz? And is he still there to this day? He is, man. Yeah. Um, He'd been, you know, doing so, he, so Craig, so Craig was your guitar player in Broken Homes, and then Correct. 
Did you tell me a story at one time that Kravitz showed up at one of your gigs and, and you thought he was there to check out the music, but he was actually headhunting uh, Craig? He did. I mean, that's how it came about. But um, by then, we were already on our last legs. We had done three albums and MCA had sunk. Uh, you know, that's back when a video would cost 300 grand. And we did several of those. And um, and again, man, no one was getting it. You know, they didn't know what to do with us. And so we're just one of those um, one of those bands that uh, sort of um, ended up frustrated and we've been through several managers and stuff and um when you know so at that point when craig uh when craig um oh and also our uh a and r guy had left and there was a whole new regime at the record company which never works right i mean because no one wants you to be successful then because somebody else is going to get the credit the last guy is good you know so it was one of those deals so we knew what was going on and you know craig uh jumped at the at that chance you know but i did i would look straight down and i'm like hey there's Lenny Kravitz. how cool you know <laughs> but, uh, my, but, uh, uh, this is sort of off off top it's well it's on topic but it's it doesn't really uh a, a, a guy here from austin who's a close friend of mine that i've known since he was a child was craig's guitar tech for many many years uh when, when yeah. he worked for kravitz yeah jeff tweedy yeah oh yeah cool cool yeah. right right yeah, thought that was really cool. That you guys were you guys were roommates at one point, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I lived with Tweety for years and years. I guess uh, from around ninety or ninety one till like two thousand, and uh, the, a lot of those those first few years, I moved in with Jeff. He was working for Craig. Nice. Man. I'd see yeah. like you know bags and boxes of picks and strings that would have Craig's name all. Tweety would bring home his fucking guitars to work on. It's have sure. Craig Ross's guitars in my living room and shit. So <laughs> we had a bit of a there was a Texas connection with the broken homes because um, you know back then you would uh, you would connect with people um, who were you know similar to you know luckily our albums reached um, some folks and later on a few years after us uh, that's how I met. Uh, the Black Crows guys, because they were like, hey, here's another rock band from Atlanta, you know, rock and roll guys doing some similar stuff. And um, so we predated the Black Crows by several years. Um, I think they figured out how to market them pretty well. I don't, I don't know, you know, you know, but uh, maybe it took a few, you know, took a few years to work on that. But, um, but again, they, you know, it was a cover song. But they that, right. got those guys the attention. Right. And I think and that so, they were they were trying to throw the moniker Southern Rock at them a little bit. True. But we had a connection with uh with Texas because um at the time the our record label MCA and our AR guy, um, Michael Goldstone had also signed uh, Charlie Sexton. So with Charlie mm -hmm came uh, his band and his crew guys like Wayne Nagel and all these, uh, uh, awesome. you know, Austinites, man. And yeah. uh, the ARC, right? The, yes. Uh, I used to, I used to Austin, work there. I used Austin to rehearsal, Austin recording Austin complex. Austin rehearsal, rehearsal complex. Yeah. yeah. That was Wayne's spot, right? Yeah. I've got yeah. some oh, of their yeah. gear. I've got some of that gear or the rental gear in my garage right here behind me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Man. That's yeah. fantastic. Jason. And, that spawned a wonderful record, man. That Archangel's record is still yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. And um, particularly the song um, Famous Jane. It was a Tony O'K mm. and Charlie composition. Mm. But if you revisit the lyrics on that, man, it's like, uh, it's a beautiful story. It's like a fictitious Jane. It, it, it as, as a, you know, they, the premise that she, it was one girl that all these bands were singing out. So Sweet oh, Jane, yeah. Lady Jane, you know. Sure. Uh, it ties them all in. It's a beautiful, uh, That's beautiful cool. concept. And Don Harvey, coincidentally, played drums on the first Broken Homes album. Wow. wow. That's cool. Yeah, he was uh, he was my my boss for a minute. Wow. All yeah, kinds him of and, connections. Him and Wayne. Him and Wayne were about... We have uh, we have Wayne scheduled to be one of our guests on this podcast. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, Just to pick hey. his brain about the same kind of shit as you guys. Oh, great. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so then... Uh, Next, I guess that the band that people would uh, know you from is uh, Izzy Stradlin. So, tell us what? How did you uh, end up working with Izzy, and what was the time lapse between Broken Homes and Izzy? Very short. 
I mean, it's a matter of months. Um, I, uh, you know, after Craig left, I believe we did a few more shows with uh, Charlo Quintana on drums and Mark Ford played guitar um, for us. So uh, we, we sort of limped along that way for, for a few months. And then that sort of, uh, you know, we just sort of stopped doing gigs. I don't, you know, I really can't recall how we broke. We just fizzled out really. And then, um, so Mark had his band on, on Epic Burning Tree. And I believe I played a few shows with them. Um, but uh, quickly after, it was only one or two, um, as far as I can recall. And um, so I remember watching TV. You know, Izzy and I had been friends for several years prior to that because 85 was when, um, you know, I, I, I imagine when was the first GNR record? When did that come out? 87. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So 87. So GNR was basically, they had opened up for the Broken Homes and several shows around LA and they were sort of getting their uh, act together. And, um, one of them was like a frat party at UCLA and pretty, pretty funny stuff. But um, they, uh, and I had uh, made a trip back to the UK in 85. I believe it was with Stiv Faders and uh, he and I were in London and he bailed to go to Paris, leaving me homeless. I, I was on the street. I couldn't afford where we were staying. So, yeah, um, so I was walking around like, and so I ended up on Wardour Street. And hopefully, and back then, man, you could go into a certain pub or a certain, you could look in the back of a certain newspaper and find out who was playing. Or um, if you got lucky, you'd, re you'd see some guy who looked kind of like you or whatever. And, you, you know, that's how we all connected. So there was, you know certain areas where that would happen birds you know, of cities feather. that were alive with some sort of screen indeed yeah. and so uh this time i saw that oh wow man guns and roses was playing right on the street i was at a on wardour street and that's where the um the marquee club was and that was their first trip over there and so um i ended up sort of carrying a guitar in or whatever and dell and and izzy who was my buddy um already and you know with the other guys they let me stay at their place for the three weeks of that tour. So I was there for their whole first run. And, um, but that's how I knew Izzy. And so we'd hung out quite a bit in different in here, you know, here in LA and, um, in London. And, and so, uh, when I, uh, one day I was just watching the TV and, um, Kurt Loder was talking about, you know, Izzy had quit. Uh, the band so I, was like, oh, I wonder what he's gonna do and the phone rang and he's like hey man you know what are you doing i'm like i'm watching tv <laughs> you like left the band and, stuff. and he's on like, no, tv what are you doing? Yeah. he goes no what are you doing musically I said nothing he goes i'll be at your house in 48 hours and so that's sort of how that started wow. and uh when he arrived um you know he did he just had a couple of couple of tunes and stuff and really you know, we were starting from scratch and, um, but I was in, you know, absolutely. I'd love to, love to do that. And we didn't really have a band. So it all began sort of here. And, um, I had been playing in Ian McClagan's band, uh, Craig and I both had been playing in Ian McClagan's band here. So I knew Mac and, um, we would, uh, eventually need a drummer and a guitar player. And, um, so we had, so, um, I ended up getting Charlo, uh, who had been with me in the Broken Homes and I got McClagan on the record. And then we, the Broken Homes had also toured with the satellites. So I had a relationship with Rick and one day Izzy's like, yeah, I want to find a guitar player like, like Rick Richards, you know, I'm like, well, let's get Rick Richards. Well, there is, there aren't any, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's that's how that uh it fleshed itself out eventually but um the you know initially you know is he at the time i mean they were massive and he wasn't a huge fan of being in hollywood um to uh do anything and so we were looking for a studio 
was a bit away from this. And, um, and we found one down in Redondo Beach. And it was like some hippies at a studio down there. I, I think it was our manager, Alan Nevin, because we we'd gotten Alan back on board after he had been sacked from the GNR thing. And Izzy wanted him back. And, um, and rightly so, uh, because, um, you know, he helped us out a lot. So I think um, Alan knew about that studio and uh, total access. So we went down there and it was out of the way. And we started recording down there until um, the riots of uh, 92, at which point we were under, under gunfire. Um, was happening outside of the studio. So one day, I think that was prior to Charlie having uh, come on board permanently. So we we had uh, Stan Lynch from the Heartbreakers was playing drums that day. And um, we knew shit was getting a little hairy because we were down by Torrance and Hawthorne Boulevard or something. So we had told the engineer to like, let us know. He was watching the news. So like, let us know when, you know, if we need to evacuate. And uh, sure enough, during a track, he was like, yeah, automatic weapons fired on, you know, Hawthorne, whatever avenue. So we were like, fuck it. I turned around and Stan Lynch had left so quickly. Like his headphones were still like floating in, in midair. I never like saw a, him again. Never Scooby, saw him again. Scooby-Doo episode, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah it was a, he was out the door, gone. And so uh, Izzy and I grabbed the tapes and uh and the guitars and we hightailed it out of there too and um the next day we were on a plane to chicago trying to finish the thing up you know and then subsequently from uh from chicago we moved to uh copenhagen denmark we try to stay a little bit ahead of uh whenever you know if, if the record company figured out where we were we we'd move <laughs> So that that first uh, Juju Hounds record is really really good, man. I mean that thing is excellent. I, it's my favorite uh, record to come out of the GNR camp, out of all the solo records that various guys have done. It's the, it was the first one, and in my opinion, it's still the best one. Yeah, it's, too, bad, too bad we didn't know how to market it. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna, that's what I was going to ask you. Did you guys even tour that thing? Because I don't remember a lot of buzz about you know you guys being on the road for that record. Look, man, <laughs> it was the same brick wall. It really yeah. was, and we toured the entire planet uh, before we toured the United States for that reason. Ah. That was the reason. We, you, uh, you would think it, with with Izzy's name recognition, it would be an easier sell than the Broken Homes, you know? Well, it was an easier sell. Um, and people, a lot of people bought it for that reason. I don't think we would have been allowed to make that record had it not been for his association with GNR. Yeah. And he paid for it. So we weren't answering to any record company. We were, uh -huh. you know, no one had put up the funds. We were going to make the record we wanted to make, which we would never have been allowed to make under any under. If we'd been a new band, it wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't have gotten that far. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we didn't have three hundred grand to make a record with for sure. You know, but um, but that's uh, that's what happened. I mean, that's the problem um, in a nutshell. And so we uh, we um, initially didn't want to tour the States at all for that reason. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we went everywhere else, man. We went, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, all of Europe uh, a few times. We did um, a promo tour of Europe and then we returned, started in the UK and covered all of Europe again. And so by the time, um, you know, we reached the end of that. That took a good, you know, year and a half or something. And then yeah. there were, you know, we just kept getting hammered for you got to do some American days. And so we said, you know, finally it was like, okay. And um, we started it in Tijuana. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but then, uh, you know, and as we toured, man, you know, I mean, this was, we'd come off this global thing where every gig was packed and we, you know, sometimes do end up doing an, an extra night or something. And it was, still, you know, 
Japan was insane. You know, people mobbing the place and outside of the hotel and all this shit. And then we came here and we ended up, we played at some bowling alley. I remember people were bowling and watching the TV, you know, of, of bowling. You know, they're bowling and they're watching themselves bowl and we're playing. And, uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, that's well, uh, welcome home. kind of discouraging yeah. to say the least. And uh, what also happened was um, a lot of the uh, press media stuff that we and found ourselves having to do in the States, they wanted to ask uh, two questions. Um, probably without even having listened to the record, they would say, why did, you know, why, why did you quit Guns N' Roses and why are you not playing Guns N' Roses songs? Yeah. And that was it. Nobody had any sort of a vision of uh, anything grander than that. that was, yeah. was, you know, and that wears you down after a while and it was discouraging for him. Yeah. Um, which is why ultimately, uh, you know, again, you know, you can only beat your head against the wall, uh, enough you know a certain number of times it's a very finite road yeah tell us tell us something about izzy that we don't know because he's a very mysterious guy you know and he's he's got this reputation as being very reclusive and he was always the quiet guy in guns and roses as someone who traveled the world with him and drove around in a van with him uh what was he like as a person he's great man he's funny as hell he's a funny guy and um i think uh what happened with several of those guys, I mean, I, I don't, I understand it, man. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, look, this is a guy that went from basically living in his car to being in the uh, biggest band on the planet within six or eight months. Yeah. So, um, and at the time uh, in the United States, we didn't have, Facebook or Instagram, but we had the National Enquirer and we had these rag magazines, you know, and they would, um, you know, they would, once you become a target of, of those types of people, um, they can put you in, they can paint you in any, any way they, they feel is appropriate to sell their magazine or whatever. But um, when it's a band and, you know, they're saying this about this band member and this about the other band member, you know, or making stuff up and uh, shit like that. You know, um, you become a target, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a media target. So it was really uncomfortable for those guys even getting around town. I remember like Duff bought a, a white Corvette convertible. Right. I'm like, dude, what are you, doing? you know, and, uh, you know, so he's driving down the road and going to rehearsal and he'd end up with like eight or 10 cars following him. You know, he's like, you know, beautiful blonde hair guy driving this, you know, freaking convertible. It's like, bro. And um, so that's where, you know, some guys that were uh, more sensitive to that, you know, sort of recoil from uh, from that attention and became uh you know, sort of uh, um, secretive and uh, um, having to move around sort of clandestinely and things like that. Like imagine, you know, the Rolling, like the Rolling Stones have to do today. I mean, uh, Keith at one point said he had a nine to five job simply because they nine to five at night, you know, in, in the morning, simply because when they have to function, go do something, there's just fewer people awake to encounter, you know, it, yeah. makes, it makes sense. So, I mean, at one point, I, I recall, you know, Izzy wanting to, wanting to buy like a, we wanted to get to the gigs in like a, just wanted to buy like a, just a, uh, like a white, plain white van. So he could drive himself to the gigs without getting, you know, chased around or any yeah. of that nonsense. Yeah. That's so, just um, that's just smart anyway when you kind of it is, yeah. whether it's hindsight or not I you know not to I think Duff uh was he'll even tell you he's a different he was a different guy back then Of course I yeah, yeah. We, all we, were, we, we all were yes yeah it's true yeah, yeah. but just perspective and, yeah Oh for sure and uh yeah man so um and so, he's uh, developed, a, he's gotten to the point now where the less he says, the more mysterious he becomes. And right. So that's a, that's a good trick, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, can, yeah. you can figure out how to do that, man. 
fantastic. Yeah. It's probably, you know, we, we live in a society where everybody feels like they have to be talking all the time because there's cameras everywhere and yeah. you have the technology like we're using right here today. Um, and I often tell my wife when we're watching the news and somebody's basically digging themselves a hole because they won't just shut up, you know, sure, like sure. you're not obligated to talk to anybody unless you're in a courtroom or something like right. that. So do yourself a favor and just shut up. It's OK. It's OK I, to not talk. <laughs> I think uh, I think is he I mean, <clears throat> I've never technically been in the room with him before, but I'll, I'll I will say this about just the way sort of I see it from afar is like, that's really smart. Oh, yeah, really? it's all, yeah, it's smart. all extremely, extremely smart and very ninja. And when you sure. think about, uh, like, I don't know, Kurt Cobain, uh, who blatantly would tell, would grab the microphone and go, I hate this interview. You know, I don't want to do this interview but everyone's yelling at me saying I have to do this interview. So I have to fill up your time when I don't even want to be here. Oh, absolutely. It, right. it just when you put the two, you know, the two sort of like uh, perspectives together, um, they're the same perspective in a roundabout way. I feel like less, less is more. And if you're trying to be a mystery, don't do interviews, get the hell out of town. Uh, only do, you know, do that nine to five. Like, like you're saying, Keith did. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's genius. Yeah. yeah. Well, if this right now had been on the radio, I'd be a lot more handsome, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> it's true. It's true again. There's a lot of truth being told here on the Talk Louder <laughs> podcast. Yeah. It's, there's a whole lot of truth going on in this room all the time, <laughs> yeah. actually, which is great. We love this. So, so you did the you did the first record with Izzy, um, but you didn't do the second album. So so what? What led to you and Izzy parting company? I did do the second album because nobody heard it. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that, yeah, uh, you did. It never came out. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you're, you're credited on a couple <laughs> tracks, but I think Duff is also on that album. Is that right? Yeah, this is predates that by several years. We we went after the, the tour that we did. We um, holed up and uh, we started recording a record at Wessex Studios in um, in London because. Um, I was where the pistols and the clash and a bunch of kick-ass records were made in there. And so we started there um, recording uh, basic tracks with um, fabulously talented engineer Bill Price, um, who had also engineered on those records that I mentioned. And um, we started there and then uh, Rick you know, came over and we had the band over and then we decided to split from there uh, to go to Trinidad Island in the West Indies. And um, we found a studio down there called the Caribbean Sound Basin. And so we got old Bill Price, uh, we packed him up and uh, we flew down to Trinidad and stayed in the studio for a number of months, um, living upstairs and uh, recording downstairs. And so, and the band was, you know, they were shit hot from we'd done. You know, the first album we were just becoming a band. We we didn't, you know, we hadn't played a show or anything. And so after having done the whole world tour, we uh, we were ready to go. So we were knocking them out. And it was at that point, um, after several months of um, you know, recording some basic tracks that uh that I think uh, Izzy became a little disillusioned and was faced with the prospect of doing it all over again, another tour. And, um, and we had already turned some things down or Izzy had turned some things down. One of them being, we did one show with uh, Keith Richards and the expensive winos we played in San Francisco when Bill Graham was still alive. And we did the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium up there and um i just found out this last year i believe it was that uh keith had offered us the entire tour and and it was us who turned it, we turned it down so i had uh you know izzy turned it down so i you know that's uh that was some bad news right? yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh but you know uh 
again, it, 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 it tells me that he was already uh, a little bit reticent to, um, didn't know really what was going to happen if we carried on and that, you know, doing, doing it. And um, so basically what happened was uh, I stayed after the, the, the drummer and um, he, Charlie and, and Rick had split and I was down there with Izzy and I went over to the next island to go scuba diving. I'm a uh, diver. And so it was a beautiful place. And so I went over there hoping that he would do his lead vocals because everything else is probably, you know, pretty much done. And then I was going to come in and sing some backups or whatever. And uh, when I called back to the studio, he was gone, you know, and I'm like, well, where'd he go? We don't know. And that was it. I actually, uh, I flew to, uh, I, I ended up finding him and I flew to, uh, he was in Denmark and I flew over there and I just realized he didn't, you know, he didn't appreciate me tracking him down but i was just you know i was looking for some answers like look what do i tell the other guys really because i got these guys on board you know what am i supposed to where am I, and what do i do with the gear more importantly yeah. and what do i tell the guys from the record company who at that point had put some money into it so it placed me in a awkward position to say the least but that was you know i was more concerned about the band that was my favorite band and um that i you know still is favorite thing that i've done yeah and um so i was uh took me a long time to recover from that one i never did really <clears throat> yeah well that fir that first record is is just great anyone that doesn't have that first izzy stradlin and juju hounds record interestingly dave um also this year <clears throat> uh it's come to my attention that uh through some odd magic of the internet some of those basic tracks have surfaced from those trinidad sessions and i don't know anything other than that that they're you know i don't know where you would find them or anything but uh from what i understand it's a funny story because i know that there were only three cassettes made um one or maybe four bill price had one izzy had one and i had one and one was sent to Tom Zuta, and I believe it's that one that ended up uh, surfacing in a storage locker uh, around here somewhere that some guy had done one of those auction things where he like bid, you know, on the storage locker and got it. He's like, wow, there's all these like cassettes and stuff in there. And so I think he uh, realized what he had and sold that to someone on the on the internet was it and was it mixed and mastered tracks or was it rough no, no. Mix? i mean it was basic tracks but yeah, the like basic rough. tracks back then yeah. were all of us playing so yeah. um oh all right so i have heard some snippets of it and it's the bill price it's bill price's mix of the basic tracks and right. so you know, if anyone's curious enough to want to follow that little trail wow yeah, wow interesting interesting so, wow, that, I'd love to hear those tracks because uh, anything that was coming out of those sessions, I mean, I know the, where Dave will be later. Yeah, <laughs> Rabbit Hole City. Yeah. Hey, me too. I'd love to hear. Him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you uh, you part ways with Izzy Stradlin, uh, and then you end up in Buck Cherry. Uh, so, I didn't know I had parted ways with Izzy Stradlin until <laughs> okay. I, I waited around for about seven years. <laughs> because I don't know, you know, sometimes, I mean, I wouldn't hear from the guy for six months and he'd call. So I was hoping it would be something like that. But I ended up turning down um, a few offers from uh, to do anything else because that's, you know, I wanted to play with him. What'd you turn uh, down? Can you tell uh, us? Some stuff, man, you know, some shit yeah. that, uh, you know, probably would have made me a, a wealthy man. But, um, you know. What are you going to do? I wanted to play with my friends, man. And uh, so, um, it, yeah, it took me a while to recover from that. And then that um, devolved into a serious drug habit and problem, um, as often does in those situations. So I had to do that whole thing. I had to go down in the toilet and then, you know, try to climb my way back up. By the time I did, it was like 2005. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
but uh but yeah that's where actually probably 2004 i started back up a little bit i was playing with mike stinson um he's a great buddy of mine and uh i believe a national treasure uh, songwriter right now currently i mean he's uh He's left L.A. and gone back to Virginia, but he's just a brilliant, wonderful um, songwriter. And he's fronting his country band. So I was playing with him with uh, Tony Gilkison, uh, a Los Angeles legend. Tony played with X for a while and um, has been active and just, you know, a, just a, a stunningly great guitar player. And uh, we had a several amazing drummers as well. David Kemper from Bob Dylan's band was playing for a little while. And so it was a great way for me to, you know, ease back into it. And we were playing, you know, bars. And so uh, one day Rick Richards came to town and I picked him up at the airport and uh, we were just hanging out. So I took him to see one of Mike's gigs that I wasn't playing. And um, he and I were at the bar and uh, the guy came in who was Keith Nelson. I had never met Keith Nelson, but he was, he was a, you know, he recognized Rick and he was a big Rick admirer as any guitar player should be. And um, I overheard him talking to Rick and he's like, Hey, whatever happened to that bass player, you know, in the juju house, <laughs> you know, my head was down on the bar. You know, he's like, Rick's like, he's right here, man. <laughs> so, so that's how that came to pass. Wow. So, so you joined in time for Buck Cherry did two records, went on hiatus, and then came back, and that's the time. That's the point that you joined in time for the fifteen record. Correct. I mean, they uh, Keith had done. Um, sorry, that was the cops. Um, Keith, Are they coming not, to your house? Not this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard a tow truck a minute ago. And now the cops are coming to. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a normal yeah, day. Yeah, get out of here. Uh, normal but, uh, what was the question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so um, again, man, I'm a band guy. I don't like playing with people I don't know. Uh, it's just, you know, how it goes. I don't know. I've developed an aversion to that sort of thing. So um, I had to sit with Keith a while, you know, and figure out. Uh, well, I think I, you know, I did some recording with him and stuff. And I think he was testing me out, too, to see if I was, you know, still coherent or had brain damage or whatever. And um, so uh, I, he said, you know, when the time came for he and Josh to decide to continue this thing, he asked me to, um, you know, he presented it as if we're, you know, do you want to make a record? And um, and I had expressed to him like, well, I'm not, you know, I, I like to be in a band. And um, so that was really uh he's like oh yeah, yeah you can you know you can submit songs and we'll write some tunes and stuff like that so it'll be fantastic you know okay i'm in for that and um that's what we did uh wrote some songs in a rehearsal place real quick and it came about very quickly i had no um expectations beyond that i just wanted to make a record it's been a while since i've been in the studio and these guys you know seem like they playing a little rock and roll music. So I was into that and we did it. And, um, you know, uh, it started to, uh, you know, get some ground. Sure. That record was, <laughs> that record went huge. I mean, that was a, a big, big record. Uh, probably still the biggest of the band's career. At the time, it was a bit of an anomaly, man. No real, you know, rock rock and roll records were, you know, reaching platinum status. I think, uh, I think that actually, the fact that that happened and it worked, um, inspired a lot of, uh, a lot of other rock bands to sort of reunite, you know, a lot of bands started to reunite like shortly after that and say, well, if those guys can do it, you know, we could do it too. Um, and, uh, a lot of like eighties bands, you know, would started, doing their their thing again um and uh but cherry was one of those uh outliers as well in the fact that they were never they weren't even around in the 80s they were like you know still wearing short pants or whatever back then so so 
when they were too young. So, I mean, they, they came late nineties. And, uh, so, um, but we ended up, uh, playing, you know, if you play that type of music or that style, I guess you get lumped in with a lot of, uh, eighties bands and that sort of thing, which we tried to avoid at first, but after a while you go where, uh, you go where the people are. Yeah. Well, you had a, a great run with Buck Cherry, uh, a number of albums. I always thought the Confessions record, the last album that you appeared on, was criminally overlooked. I don't know why that one went so flew under the radar, but to me, that was the best album in a long while from the band, and I don't think it didn't really get much traction. Well, the first, uh, you know, 15 um, was turned down by every major label. And uh, to the to the point where our manager Alan Kovac had to start his own label to put it out. Um, so, and then uh, once uh, Alan did his magic, um, it uh, we reached uh, three hundred thousand copies sold. At which point, Atlantic Records showed up again after having passed on the band twice, I believe. And they're like, "Oh well." We didn't know you were going to sell 300,000 records. So welcome to Atlantic Records. <laughs> you know, which is, again, man, don't even get me started on that. But uh, again, but um, the uh, <laughs> that's probably why, because when you're on, you know, a label like Atlantic, they have a huge publicity and marketing campaign behind the thing. And unfortunately, that's the way it goes, man. You know, if you know, you keep seeing the image, you know, and after a while it sinks into the public subconscious and you become a, like a household name, you know, people recognize the name, you're still seeing it. And you also begin to have access to late night television. You're on the tonight show. You're on the, you know, uh, the New York equivalents and equivalents of those. Um, we did a lot of TV and then, um, of course, that wave uh, kept growing and growing uh, to the point where other bands um, would want us to open up. And it was sort of that package, like with Motley Crue, we spent a month with those guys in Japan alone, I think. And uh, that sort of, and they ended up using our set as part of their DVD package because we had the same management stuff. And so that, you know, is sort of a mutual benefit. I think Motley Crue was starting to stage a little bit of a comeback at that point as well. And so, you know, we had hits on the radio and they didn't. And so uh, that's how that came about. And we spent a lot of time with those guys. Yeah. I mean, you did the Motley tour, you toured with Kiss. You, I think you toured with ACDC. Which of those, which of those tours was the most fun for you? Uh, our own. <laughs> no, man, it's great, you know, to play uh, from these, you know, bands and stuff, and you end up playing a lot of people that you wouldn't have otherwise um, sometimes. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that you encounter, for, you know, we want to be truthful, uh, again, is that, uh, I mean, for me, it was unusual, you know, these are things I, again, I've been dormant. I hadn't toured in a decade. And, uh, so for me, it was wild to see the amount of production involved in these shows and how the amount of performance had the amount of production had increased the performance had decreased to the point where nobody's singing their own backup vocals and shit like that, you know, which I find disturbing. And, um, and I also find at a certain point when you are a band who's actually performing and ever not using any tracks or pre-recorded anything, the, the crowd has sort of begun now to, uh, they've become inured to the, the backing tracks and they want to hear the song sounding exactly like the record. And then when you're up there actually performing, we reached a point now where it's flip flop. They'd be like, Oh, those guys suck. You know, it didn't sound anything like the record. It's like, yeah, cause we're actually, we're actually playing yeah. and singing for better or for worse, but that's the way it goes. You know, sometimes, you know, I don't know why you would go to a show wanting to hear the record, just stay at home and listen to the record. Yeah. 
So um, what what ultimately led to your departure from Buck Cherry? Uh, well, um, uh, I believe that at a point where you have a platinum record and um, have conquered that, you know, the mythical beast that is American music scene, that's the time where you need to uh, really start to get to work and establish foreign markets um, by going there and continually hitting them. Um, unfortunately, the short game doesn't allow that. That's a long-term goal. And um, I had had it um, happen to me a couple of times before. And um, if you have a hit in the United States, you're good for about two years. And then, uh, you know, that's the, you start to, uh, you start to um, travel back down the toilet. So um, uh, by, you know, if you're, if you're making a hundred grand a night in the States, the prospect of making five grand a night in Europe doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, it does if you, if you want to survive, but um, if you want to make a bunch of money real quick, that's what you do. You stay in the States, but um uh, you know, I, I was trying to express that, you know, our success wasn't infinite. You know, we had to do some work in other parts of the globe that would sustain us long term. You know, you've, you guys have heard, you know, bands that basically can't get a gig here. They still go to Europe and uh, or elsewhere, South America or anywhere else. And they have a you know, wonderful summer. And then, you know. That's basically what it is. So um, I was uh, I was afraid. I was fearful that that was going to happen, and um, so I was pretty vocal about it. And uh, some people don't like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, 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 differing philosophies on uh, on touring and and survival. And what? Yeah. Yeah, Sur it's a problem. Sur yeah, survival. Yeah, survival. Different yeah. Philosophy. survival. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, it, it um, sounds to me like you you had a you wanted to put you know your gardening gloves on and and they just wanted to eat it right out of the ground. Well, I mean, I think in the Midwest at some point, some kid came up to me and he said, um, "I've seen your band thirty six times this year," and. You know, I started wondering about that. Wow. Like, <clears throat> like <throat> shit, really? We, <laughs> you know, 36. And, um, you know, that's what happens. Um, and also, you know, if you're not paying attention to a map and you're just sort of following the, the where the bus goes, you know, you play one town and then, you know, you drive or drive and drive. And then two weeks later, you play the town right next door to that one. Mm -hmm. If you're not paying attention to where you're going. And so all those people, and then you start wondering, like, hey, how come no one's showing up? We turned, we played here like two weeks ago. Yeah. So, um, you know, you start, you know, you start, you start recognizing the front row. Yeah, you start, yeah. you know, uh, I pass that McDonald's, like, uh, that looks familiar. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, yeah, we were just sort of going around in circles in the same four states and Canada. Yeah. That was it. And I believe that's uh, where you can find them today. Yeah, they. Uh, we just had Billy Rowe on the on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he was in Canada uh, joining us on a day off. But they, uh, Buck Cherry's managed to sustain a career. You know, even maybe maybe not. I don't know if they tour Europe as much as as you would like. Um, but they've managed to make a a decent run of it, I guess. Um, but it is interesting that you know. You left, Keith left, Xavier left, um, and then there's been some guys that were even real short-term replacements that have since come and gone. Um, it's clearly Josh's baby at this point, and maybe has been for quite some time. You talk to Keith anymore? Yeah, I spoke to Keith, uh, you know, often. Uh, I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's around, and he's doing uh, some studio stuff, and... Um, you know, Any chance you guys would work together again? Um, I, you know, I don't know I, and, and what capacity that would be. But um, again, man, I think uh, when bands start that revolving door of uh, 
of guys. You know, you got to, there's a, there's a turd in the pool there somewhere. And uh, I love Billy, man. He and I got a long history prior to, uh, to um, his joining Buck Cherry. And I wish him the absolute best. He's a great guy. Yeah, he is. I really friend. like Billy a lot. Yeah, And I've known him, you know, since Jet Boy. And, uh, you know, again, LA sort of a, you know, bunch. So at one point we're all living in the same apartment down the way and shit. I wasn't, but I was hanging out at theirs quite a bit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, and I wish them the best, man. It's great. And it's great, you know, that Buck Jerry is able to tour at all because that's a, that's a huge uh, accomplishment um, for them. And uh, they're able to sustain, you know, with a, a bus and a trailer and all that stuff. And so it's uh, not um, uncomfortable. And they could probably do that indefinitely. And I hope they are able to regain um, the, the level of success that we had here in that period, you know, because I think it's still attainable, but it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of sacrifice financially to do that. Yeah. And uh, I hope, you know, at some point it dawns on, on Josh that maybe that's a, that's a worthwhile endeavor. I think yeah. that I think that on on one side of the coin and then the other side of the coin can be what everybody else thinks. But on one side of the coin, it's, coin it seems to be uh, apparent that a band like Buck Cherry is staying alive, keeping it alive, whatever it is, the version of that you know dirty old rock and roll that they do. Yeah, um, and the fans are looking at that side of the coin and probably not um, other philosophies of what it is that you need out of a band situation, a family, if you will, situation as a, as a group of kids who write songs together in a room and then get the record out on by any means possible on a, a deal that doesn't suck too bad and mm -hmm. are able to uh play the songs that you sweated uh blood over and that mean something to you uh in front of a crowd somehow um i feel like that's i'm looking i'm turning the coin over when i say Indeed. That. no no i i i understand i i um i believe that uh a, in, a, in a band, there's a chemistry, and I believe that chemistry, is, it, even though it's intangible and inaudible, I think uh, people can subconsciously feel it when they listen to the music that's recorded by a band um, and a bunch of friends yeah. and, uh, and stuff. And so um, when circumstances uh, uh, arrive that somehow you're not that anymore and you've replaced a lot of people i feel like you 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 tend to alienate the core of people that made you successful in the beginning and those are all replaced now by a different demographic of uh, concert goers who are there to see the hit songs and that's it and so um you know it's a different bunch of people but uh i prefer forming for that first bunch I think both sides of the coin, as long as both of them can stay shined up and, and you know, mirror what they're supposed to say about um, a song, a record, a band, um, both sides of the coin can, can, can be helpful. But, Absolutely. You know, when, when, you, when you decide to, to get out of a situation like that, it's not, you know, you're, I feel like uh, it depends on who it is, but... If you decide to jump ship, just for lack of terminology, um, it's not because you don't like the people. It's not because you don't like the material. It's not because it's a personal gain, gain here for you to give your opinions on what, how you really feel about where you are as a band and what needs to happen here. Otherwise, we're just going to go make a bunch of money and then go home and then go out and do it again. And there's not really, you're not. Uh, the constant gardener then you're just taking no, and, uh, you're you saying yes to everything in, you find yourself in a situation where you're touring for two and three years at a time without making a record or without you know writing any songs yeah and um you know that's uh that's a uh a, a, a bad situation to be in um and um you know uh i um it seems to me that uh 
you know, that's, that's, um, it's a, it's a bit, it's, it's sort of the beginning of, uh, you know, the end, then you'll find yourself yeah. in that cycle of playing the same songs exactly the same way every night. And it's, uh, sort of dulled the shine a little bit, you know, right. but again, the concert goer doesn't realize any of that right. stuff happened and they, they enjoy the show and that's what it's all about. I yeah. like it that you're that you're you're sharing these um, as as Dave. I'll just keep calling it philosophies. Um, you know, even though you've been, I'll use your words too, dormant, and then you're back on, and then you're dormant, and then you're back on. For whatever reason, it seems to be their personal reasons. Whether you found yourself um, hurt uh, because of we all have demons, right? And uh, by the way, thank you for sharing and being totally like just naked with us about, you know, your life story here and things up and down, you know. Um, I think that it's uh, like your, I, I hate the word resume, but all of the shit that you have, that you've gotten to do is impressive on this other side. But when I talk to you, even though it's in a computer room, um, I feel what you're you know why your reasons why and 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 uh how excited you are and and how you were sort of like really wanted to continue with Izzy for not just a money grab there was you were you you had this you felt like you had this connection with the yeah. material and with him and 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 with other people I like how you even started down that same road when you we're basically interviewing Keith just as much as he, Keith Nelson, just as much as he was interviewing you about why do you want me? Well, why do what? What's the what's the scope here? You know. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, you know, from in my own the reason why I wanted to be uh, a musician at all was um, you know going back to even those days hanging out with uh, the damned in the studio and watching how this little family of people was operating, the sense of humor and stuff. And that's how I always viewed, uh, you know, uh, a band uh, as a family. And so when you um, find yourself losing that family, it takes, you know, it's a bit of a struggle to recover from that because you uh, tend to put everything you have into it. You know, and so when, when that, you know, then it takes a little while to figure out who you are as an individual. Right. Because, um, you know, at a certain point, when you're in a band, people start calling your last name becomes that band. You know, right. everything uh, right. people refer to you that way. And it well, becomes a part of you internalize it as part of your identity. Of course. And um, so that is, uh, you know, um, one of the reasons why I, I joined and also one of the reasons why I left. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you uh, you had a really successful run with with Buck Cherry and some great music and some great albums, and uh, I always enjoyed seeing you out on the road whenever you guys were making your way through Texas. So, uh, two things from me before we wrap up, and I'll and I'll let Jason jump in if he has anything else. But uh, number one, I wanted to ask what you're doing currently, if anything, music related. And then I want you to I want you to share the story that you shared with me one time about you and Steve Bader's being held at gunpoint <laughs> 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 because that is hilarious. So number one, are you doing anything musically right now? Yeah, you know, I don't want to talk about stuff unless I'm actually you know going to do it. Um, but I'm you know playing around. I, I I enjoy writing songs. I always have, and so I've got a bit of a backlog, and I'm going to try to figure out what to do with those on a small independent level, you know? Yeah. And um, again, like we, we began, I'm currently uh, moving uh, to another part of the world. And um, that will enable, you know, things like that to be a lot easier. You know, the drives are easy. I could go do a gig in Spain or whatever if I wanted to. And, and you know, I, I'm an underground I'm, I'm an underground guy, man, as musically speaking. And, um, you know, there'll always be the mainstream and there'll always be the underground. The underground now is, is, uh, alive and well, it's just a little harder to find. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd like to find those people and, uh, maybe play a couple tunes for them at some point in some capacity. Yeah. And, um, I, uh, as long as it's, uh, you know, I'm not, 
don't find myself beating my head against the wall. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to do that at some point. I don't have any guarantees on how or when or in what form that will be, but it's probably imminent. Yeah. In a year or so. Um, so I'd like to do that. I know uh, you were in Austin a few years ago. You, you, you actually stopped by my house and we went out to the races one day. But yeah, man, that was a good day. Yeah, and uh, you were in town because you were recording or writing with Hunt Sales, who played with yeah. Bowie. Um, did anything ever materialize there, or is that still in the works? Or is, can you talk about that? Yeah, I don't know, um, really. Uh, I just love, I mean, I really, after the Cherry experience, I really wanted to find, um, you know, someone that I'd be really inspired to play with. And uh, as I've uh, discovered another observation over the years is sometimes, you know, these guys are uh, some characters, right? You know, these are some uh, the people that make uh, or that kind of music or, or who are, um, you know, supremely talented at it are sometimes the folks that get, um, you know, get a bad reputation or they're sort of, you know, hard to work with or whatever. And I can relate to that. So I find that there are, you know, oftentimes the best possible people that you could seek out and play with. So, um, when I, you know, I'd known Hunt for a, quite a while. That's an interesting uh, perspective. That uh, glutton for punishment. You're looking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're losing. We're losing those guys daily. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And um, and so, in my view, it's worth uh, seeking them out because um, sometimes nobody else will. And uh, mm. I think the industry, sadly, it's gotten to a point where they don't have a lot of patience uh, right. with folks like that when they can have some other guy, you know, gladly, you know, not be a problem and right. not, you know, uh, you know, wreck the office or whatever. So, um, you know, Hunt's one of those uh, one of those characters, and uh, yeah, just he, I call musically, him musically, yeah, musically I, I, alone, he's a freaking monster. I call he, him authentic. Yeah, absolutely right, man. Yeah. We're running out of guys like that, man. Yeah. We're, we're running out of characters and personalities. It's mm -hmm. sort of a we reached a, like a vanilla uh, level here. Mm -hmm. Sadly, but um, I don't know what's going to happen with Hunt's thing. I saw him last week, man. He showed up at my fucking door. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm downstairs. Yeah, hey, yeah. what are you? I'm fucking. I'm outside. Wow. That's right. I was texting. I was texting Jimmy, trying to get him on the show, and he says, "And it'd been a while since I texted him." And so I'm, I'm calling him out of the blue, basically trying to get him on this show, and he says. And Hunt is downstairs on my doorbell, and he's like, "What's with Austin coming to get me today, you guys?" <laughs> yeah, man. Like there, was a, there was a warrant out for me that day I'm <laughs> from Austin, Texas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so, that's great, man. We had we had a good time together, and uh, always do, and uh, probably always will, man. He's a fantastic, uh, fantastic guy, and I hope he's, he does, you know, manage to get his music out in some form. Or yeah, it's really good, man. Yeah. What was the second part of that? Um, tell us, you got to tell the audience. Oh, right, right, right. You told me, but uh, tell the audience the story about you and Steve Bader's being held at gunpoint in some hotel hallway or something. What was that all about? <laughs> yeah, I had a, it was in the Broken Homes days and Steve was, uh, I was sort of palling around with Steve and stuff and and he liked the band. So he's like, I really want to, you know, I want to come to the show. And we were supposed to play at the Roxy. We did play at the Roxy. And, um, so I went to pick him up at the, what was then the Holiday Inn on Franklin and and uh, Highlands in Hollywood. And mm -hmm. uh, it's now the something totally different. But anyway, we were up in Stiv's room and I was trying to get him to hurry the fuck up to get in my car to go to the show. But, you know, that was a struggle and I should have known better, you know, that I was going to be in there for literally hours. I even did show up early, but by the time I got him, you know, he's like, no, I'm going to need this. I'm going to need this. And where, where's my hat? What's this thing? So I was with his, uh, his then girlfriend, uh, Caroline, and uh, I finally, you know, got him out of the room and I'm marching him up the hall and Caroline was closing the, the door to the hotel room. And a couple of guys passed us as we're walking down the hall. And I, you know, I may have said something, hey, what's up? These, you know, a couple of dudes look a little, you know, it's a little 
weird vibe, I remember. But then I heard a noise and I turned around and they had Carolyn down on the ground with, you know, a big old, you know, it was like a chrome something, something like boom. And the other guy's saying, all right, you guys, you know, get on your knees and empty your pockets. So I'm like, fuck. So we empty our pockets and I had like two bucks or whatever. And Stiv had a couple of money, so they a couple of bucks. So they came and grabbed his money and shit. And then um, they had the hotel room key. And at one point they said, um, you know, they open up the, the room and they said, okay, get back in the room, which I didn't like. And, uh, but we did. And so Steve and I were flat on the ground and one guy was straddling us and like killed with the gun. And he kept like bonking us on the head with the gun and shit. And then the other guy was rifling the room. And so long story short, you know, he was rifling the room. And then at a certain point they go, all right, you know, Nobody move, nobody fucking say nothing, count to 300 or whatever, because we got a guy at the end of the hall, you know, that story. So uh, they take off, and I'm waiting for a while. I'm like, you know, 72, 73, and there's just dead silence in the room. And, um, and you know, I'm, there's nobody at the end of the hall, of course. So I'm like, I had, I, I had my car keys in my hand. I'm like, I gotta still gotta get to the fucking gig. So I'm like, Stiv, man, wait, you know, come on, man, fucking get up, get up. And Stiv's like, uh, you know, I just heard, you know, like he's dead asleep <laughs> on the fucking carpet, man. I'm like, get the fuck up. <laughs> you know, let's go. It was the fucking craziest thing. And, uh, you know, I did get to the gig. I was late, of course. And then trying to explain that to my band guys, you know, <laughs> and being honest, like we honestly, we got jumped, you know, and there's, there's me and there's Stiv, you know, they're like, yeah, right, dude, you know. <laughs> Fire. Uh, wow. <laughs> hey, real real quick, I want, uh, this is a maybe almost a footnote in your in your career, but uh, a lot of people would be interested to know, tell us a little bit about your time uh, with Smack. You, you, oh. You were in that band for a minute, weren't you? Maybe literally a minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, they came over without a, a bass player, I believe was and um i think uh had a change of drummer immediately prior to their trip over but um i knew the guy who was putting on the shows the promoter for that and so he called me one day and he said hey man you know could you help you know fill in a place of bass with these guys they're from finland and they're coming over they got these shows there i'm like yeah sure i'll do it and uh so i did i started um, I think I, I can't recall how many I did, man, but I mean, it was basically went down to a rehearsal and, uh, you know, these guys barely weren't speaking great English. So there was a little bit of a, you know, a little, uh, a little language barrier there at first, but, uh, but it was rocking, man. So I did a couple of shows and I think, um, they wound up doing a palladium show or something else. And, uh, and I think for that one, I had a conflict with, I, I believe it was, I was still in the Broken Homes at the time. So Sammy Alpha jumped in and my dear buddy um, yeah. I've known for all that time. So I was happy that he was the guy to pick up the slack with that one. And he did a fantastic job as always. Wow. And he's got a great solo album, man. You guys should check out if you haven't already. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, I heard that he put one out. I haven't heard it yet, but uh, yeah, it's good, man. on my list, I'm a big Yaffa fan as well. Well, Jimmy, I could talk to you all day long, man. Uh, you know, the stories from you are always hilarious, always great. And I, I just like yeah. hanging with you, man. So uh, right next time you're uh, in Texas, uh, definitely call me, text me, whatever. Uh, I'd love to get together with you again and uh, and just hang out. You know, it's always a good time. Maybe Absolutely. We'll get, yeah, maybe we'll get Jason on board, too. <laughs> Thanks awesome. for having me, both of you guys. Jason, it's a pleasure to meet you, man. Nice, uh, nice to meet you. To, uh, Meet you in person one of these days, maybe next uh, next Texas run or whatever. Of course, I hope yeah. so. Before uh, before we let you go, um, tell us the very first record, childhood record that got you into rock and roll. Thing that that kind of the bug that bit you. Machine Gun Etiquette, the damn nice. Damn. Yes, I have that record. Yes, I that was the first one, and then I worked backwards from there. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, it's probably the only one I have, but yeah. <laughs> it's a great album all the way yes. through man. it's yeah, a it fantastic is. record Yeah. so I mean I was in that weird uh, you know transition period where I was a little young 
to have been, you know, going to gigs to see those, you know, those guys play. But um, I, I ended up seeing a ton of damn gigs and stuff. But those, you know, their records and Clash records pretty much informed me as a young uh, man. And then I sort of, as I, you know, was saying work backwards, I later discovered Led Zeppelin and the Stones and stuff. Because, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't, you know, so I worked a little bit strange for my age group. You know, I was a little bit backwards going, yeah. uh, in time. Very well, cool. You're, you're... In, interesting, uh, interesting starting point. Yeah. Uh, it was. It, it informed me musically to the point where uh, it, it that in, infused me with an appreciation for, you know, the clash uh, had prepared me for like, you know, reggae themed uh, music and was uh, able to play in that style. And, uh, and, you know, just um, both of those were just aside from punk rock or whatever it is conceptually, they were great rock and roll bands. Yes. You know? And they were, they were significant. Yes. My view. And so when I, you know, was able to dig back. And so, I mean, I think elements of that surfaced much later on, like with Izzy's record, uh, he and I were, you know, we're the same age. So um, uh, we were informed by the same stuff, yeah. you know? And uh, so that's how that, I'm glad that was able to, surface yeah 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 wow well, it's been Good great damn. having you today jimmy and it's uh again a pleasure to to talk with you and uh, oh it was my pleasure indeed gentlemen thank you so awesome. much for having me thanks. yeah absolutely thanks for being with us jimmy that was great um and like i said next time you're in texas give us a shout absolutely and with that on behalf of my co-host jason mcmaster and our special guest jimmy ashhurst i'm metal dave glessner thank you for listening to another episode of the talk louder podcast